Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Steph Sells Homes Podcast. This is episode 46, and today I have a very special friend. Um, his name is David. He's the owner of ADU University, and he's here to share a lot of information. As you guys know, those of you who follow me on these on my podcast journey know that I'm a huge ADU advocate, and a lot of my episodes are geared around the ADU play and a lot of real estate strategies. So today, we're going to really dive deep into the education portion. I think it's going to be one of the most informative podcasts as far as educating the consumer, whether you're a realtor, investor, or just your average homeowner who's looking to implement the ADU strategy. So welcome, David. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm happy to be here with you on episode 44. Yes, 46, actually. 46. <laughs> Thank <Yes>. you. <laughs> but... Yeah, I can't believe it either. It's It's been so many. It's kind of hard to keep up. But, but I know you have a podcast as well, so you understand just the consistency with time. It's been awesome to meet so many people. Uh, I met you through not the podcasting, but somewhat through just the education or the, the education uh, platform and then also like the advocating piece of it. We're both huge ADU advocates. I know that today you're going to dive deep into what ADU University is. Um, but before that, maybe you want to give people a little bit more context as to who you are, what you do, and how did you even come up with ADU University? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to share that. Uh, so originally, you know, about 25 years ago, I got involved in factory build housing. And I was able to do a, quite a bit of development in the Los Angeles area. I even did projects up in Bakersfield. Um, and so it was interesting when the ADU laws changed, to be, it just kind of pulled me in to say, hey, there's a real need. This is something I think is going to be important. And so when I went into it and started advocating for it, I found that just the term accessory dwelling unit was very confusing. People mm -hmm. think of it as a casita. Or they think it is as a, you know. As an a, accessory. <laughs> and a granny flat. Yes. <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a glorified tough shed, but what does an accessory mean? And, and the tough part is, is people have a hard time realizing that it was named that or even caring because of what they did in the California, the California state legislature. So they were able to do that to get it passed. And there was a lot of things attached to it, which is the unfortunate part about it being one of the unfortunate things. And there are a lot of positives. So I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the positives. But one of the things that I hope that they change is the valuation. I know that you have a really great appraiser that you've had on several times. And I think that having some more dialogue about how the improvement value to your property for an appraisal can actually be at the same, if not maybe a little bit higher than the price per square foot valuation to the primary home, because face it, you know, and not, and not my example is I have a 1930s, you know, small house. It's under 900 square feet in the city of Burbank, California. And in the back, we built a 734 square foot ADU. Now, it is absolutely mind boggling. I mean, Stephanie, the way that that ADU is built compared to the way that our main house is built, do not compare. Right. The ADU right. is built is 10 times better. You know, concrete slab foundation, you know, the high, you know, roof peak, all the all the energy efficiency factors are through the roof on the ADU. But if you talk to an appraisers, they're usually only given 30 percent of the value. And that's mm -hmm. if it is similar construction. Now, if it's going to be a factory built, something is off site built to the HUD code of the Housing and Urban Development Code, no one has really seen what the values are because there aren't any comparable sales or comps. So, right. so just talking about that, those aspects can be a little bit overwhelming to people and that's unfortunate. And that's one of the reasons why I want to put together the ADU University is for people to kind of understand these things. And so where we have, I've done 28 webinars. They're anywhere from 60 minutes to 90 minutes. And we go into a lot of things that affect people, homeowners primarily, when they're thinking about doing an ADU. So just as an example, with aduuniversity.org, you can see interviews with the state planners. You can hear talking to, um, this is I, one of the most recent ones I did, was with a personal coach. So, mm -hmm. so you think of coach, you might think counselor. And you think right. counselor, you say, well, why would you do that? Well... When you move a family member into your home, your property, 
there's a lot of sort of dynamics, not only with that individual themselves, but also the dynamic with other family members, which if you go from a personal kind of counselor coach, you can then kind of extrapolate out the importance of having estate planning. Because where do families usually come into issues or conflict? Money. Right. Money is a big driver, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So understanding that it's important to kind of get your ducks in a row, again, can be very kind of overwhelming because you're just trying to build that ADU. You just want to get it done. And now you're thinking, now I have to do estate planning. Mm -hmm. You really should look at that because when mom or dad or another family member are going to be moving in, you want to have it just crystal clear with everybody else in the family, not just you and your mom or your dad, but with your siblings or maybe right. their siblings, because, you know, heaven help you. You know, it's, it's going to come a time that people are going to, you know, move along, pass pass away. And you need to be able to have everything in place to, to have a kind of transition as seamlessly as possible. I agree. I mean, that's a good point. I think a lot of people don't put thought into estate planning or management. You know, now that um, what I do with my team is we help you acquire, we help you build and we help you manage because you talked about not there, there not being enough comps, you know, with ADUs and the appraisers not taking the right approach. And there's very few appraisers who do that. You talked about estate planning. I think also management is a huge component, you know, that can create a lot of friction between just co-living spaces and people not knowing how to act as a landlord because now you want to build a unit to create some passive income or create some sort of cash flow for those of you who are renting them out now you haven't probably put a lot of thought into how to be a property manager <laughs> and I you've think created that's, that's, now a job for yourself right that and is really big that. Mm -hmm. no i think management particularly when you're talking about renting is, is really a hard thing and one of the things that may happen to really kind of add some complexity to that is one of the bills by assembly member, it's either assembly member or Senator Ting, T-I-N-G, mm -hmm. was actually, and I'm not sure if you've heard about this, where he's saying or proposing that you could sell your ADU as a condominium. Right. So the one thing that, and so- um, I think you and I talked about this offline. I think it's A, B- 1033 or something like that, right? They, they were they're having talks about being able to sell it separately. And you know how you and I both feel about that. So so for everybody who's watching or listening, just thinking the idea, oh, hey, I could be able to, I could go pot, buy a single family residential unit. I could then put an ADU in the back and I could sell it, maybe keep, or keep one of them or sell both of them. There's a few issues. And that is the fact that it's a condominium and you only have two units. If you only have two units or two representatives in a condominium association, how do you break a tie? How right. do you then say, because typically if you if you haven't lived in a condo or had been a member of a homeowners association, an HOA, there are certain rules and regulations um, set forth with Davis Sterling. So that is kind of what the law that regulates homeowners. And like me, I've done developments in, home, in homeowners associations. They're difficult. They Very. particularly if they mm -hmm. don't like what, you know, like, well, I wanted you to do this, this home a different color, or I didn't right. want you to use that dark, that dark of a gray and the concrete and the driveway. And I'm like, but I got you to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, and about, so without going into a lot of detail, there are a lot of interesting laws that are coming out that possibly will come out. They're not the governor of California hasn't signed them yet, but he could. And I think that that's something to pay attention to, particularly for, you know, somebody who I would think follows you because you're going to be doing, OK, am I going to sell, develop, acquire right. so I can add to a portfolio? This really has some tremendous benefits for that. The other part of it that I was recently kind of dealing with and I want to share with people is SB9, Senate Bill 9. A lot of folks, you know it, and but just and I'm sure some of your people have, have heard about it. But Senate Bill 9 allows you to split your property into two different assessor parcel numbers, and you can right. sell one off or sell both off. And there's there are some requirements. The one thing that I see a lot of people that don't understand is that you don't have to divide them. You don't have to create that separate APN number. You could just develop your property with Senate Bill 9 so that you can have now two primary units. So as a project that I'm looking at um, right now in Burbank, 
the floor area ratio, which basically is the size of the property. And then you kind of calculate out how much buildable area that you have. So in this example, it's a fairly standard lot. It's about 7,000 square feet, a little bigger than uh, standard in Burbank, about 7,000 square feet. The floor area ratio that we're allowed to build is going to be about 1,400 square feet for a second unit, Stephanie. And that's yeah. huge. Mm -hmm. Now, so we're looking at doing a stick built with a designer and doing a big unit on the bottom, probably a three bedroom, two bath. But then we asked the city planner, well, could I do the ADU on top as a second story? And the planner's like, yes, you could. So I'm like, you don't have to figure out doing an attached or detached, you know, adding to it at the same level. You can go right on top of that second primary and then have your ADU. And in this case, it can be up to a thousand square feet in the city of Burbank. So we wow. could, in effect, add 2,400 square feet to a property in Burbank. And mm -hmm. Burbank, like a lot of uh, neighborhoods, communities that are have high um, resale values, that's huge. And I, th I think a lot of people don't understand that huge difference that you just touched on. So that was a huge gem. You don't have to subdivide the lot when you're doing SB9. You have the option of doing SB9 with an additional SFR, which I've heard just from talking to so many contractors that they've seen that for their clients, it's brought a higher ARV when you do the SB9 route versus the ADU. Because again, ADUs are just not taken into consideration the way they should when it comes to an appraiser's lens. Unless the appraiser is very knowledgeable, like Sydney, who will take the income approach, who will look at outside neighborhoods, you know, if they, he can't find enough data in that specific neighborhood. So unless it's, it's, a, it's an appraiser like Sydney, most of them are giving you a 30% evaluation price per square foot, which is very low. Uh, but I think with SB9, it, you, you do get that, that, that value. And I think and that's what a lot of people I know here in Lakewood and Long Beach are doing. Just because of the way the homes are set up in that track, it allows for that 60-40 ratio. So I think for investors, you, know, um, you may want to look at that option too, but understand the difference. So you educate a lot of people, I'm assuming, on that strategy too um countless the but, but mm -hmm. you you and i are it's it's it's, it's so much fun to talk to somebody that understands <laughs> that <this. knows. laughs> yeah. yeah because what we're talking about and i like to try to tell this to people i haven't talked to it's like this is very high level mm -hmm. this is very high level conversations um and that if you can have it which is i really want to drill home the fact that it's important to talk with someone like stephanie or myself about these things because we're we see it with a much bigger broader clearer lens of how it could affect you and your property, whether as a homeowner or an investor. So to be able to say you can do it with SB9 or an ADU. So let's talk about that just a little bit. The, mm -hmm. If you do it SB9 with a SFR, single family residential unit, you are now just basically building to the same standard that the front house is. So there's no sort of, you're not getting demoted for having an ADU. It's right. an appraiser, correct, is going to be able to value it because it's a as, second. As another SFR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's another primary unit is what we like. Another primary. You have your first primary. Now you have a second primary. And both could have ADUs. So there's a tremendous development potential. But how, and, and I guess my point for, one of the reasons for drilling down on this point is that most people don't understand that. And unfortunately, at most, or a lot, not say most, a lot of appraisers don't see it that way either. Right. Because we're and well in the rabbit appraisers, hole. There's a huge age gap between the in the appraisal world. One, you know, like most of the appraisers are tend to be older, which maybe sometimes they're just sort of set in their ways. We need like honestly more people in the appraisal world. But I don't think people really push for that as a career path. I don't know why. Um, I think, too, is they also have to abide by these rules. Right. Appraisers are always like they're always on them with rules and regulations and what they the data that they have to use in order to comp and evaluate these units. So there isn't enough data. And I think your average appraiser, just like your average realtor, if they're not really knowledgeable in the ADU play, they're not going to do their homework or their due diligence to really give you the value that it deserves. Unless you're working with people that are huge advocates, it's no different than realtors, right? Like 
not every realtor understands the ADU play. So same with architects, same with appraisers, the same with a lot of contractors, which is why it's important to work with like every single person that I just mentioned who is part of your team should be knowledgeable in this strategy and understand it from every angle so that it all comes full circle together. And now you're able to underwrite better. And But I think it's the lack of data. There aren't enough homes being sold with ADUs. There aren't enough that you know are being refied or wherever they're pulling this data from. But I think give or take, I was just talking about this in the other episode with Renafides, in the next three to five years, there's going to be enough data. And then at that point, they're going to have to like readjust their value metrics to really take it into consideration. But in the meantime, SB9 is one that it's sort of like a little loophole there where you know you're going to get the value that it deserves because it's considered an SFR, not an accessory dwelling unit. To drill home on that point. um, Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find, um, and I'm really happy to see that you're doing a lot of sort of um, education and advocacy Mm -hmm. in your area. Unfortunately, these types of um, people such as yourself are very limited. I mean, I'm in Burbank Mm -hmm. and I am a regular, I attend the uh, caravan meetings weekly and I am, I am an, you know, an affiliate. I talk about accessory dwelling in this and I'm a regular presenter there because not only did we build ours for, you know, my father-in-law, but I also follow it like you do with a lot of the state legislation. That said, I presented to the, the Burbank Association of Realtors about this SB9 issue dynamic that you and I are talking about. No one knew about it. <laughs> no one did. And so you were, and you typically, I'm presenting in front of a room of 40 to 50 people Mm -hmm. and their email blast goes out to hundreds, if not thousands of real estate agents. Right. So if you're watching or listening to this, knowing just that little, as you said, gem of information Mm -hmm. can really allow you to involve your clients, to involve, you know, potential clients or your investors, anybody just to be able to understand this thing. So I know that you offer some uh, consultation packages. Um, I offer them as well, too. And if you are, and this is a good sort of segue into what I want to talk about and focus on is factory built versus stick built, because we're talking about valuations with accessory dwelling unit categorization of development versus development with SB9. Those are two very, very different things. So now look at the different types of construction that's a whole other topic. <laughs> it is yeah. huge, but talk about differences. Mm-hmm. Right now, factory built, which people kind of understand, even though manufactured is the state term with the housing and urban development or HUD or HCD, housing community mm-hmm. development at state level, they call it manufactured homes. So manufactured homes is, doesn't kind of roll off the tongue, doesn't kind of get that right. mental picture the way factory built does. So factory built manufactured, modular, you know, there are pre, even people think prefab, you know, right. it's all built off site and then, and then dropped off. Even with prefab, it could be just walls and roof components stacked on a flatbed and then delivered mm-hmm. very simply where the majority of the work would have to be done on site, which is how ours was done. Mm-hmm. But factory built can usually mean, usually means that you're going to have 90% of the work done in a factory. The inspections, exactly. the inspections are already done at the factory. So you don't have to worry about rough plumbing or electrical. You don't have to worry about insulation or drywall. And the nice thing is the cabinetry, countertops, and flooring is all there. And you just have to kind of get it delivered. You have to have accessibility. And that's the biggest factor. So if you're... You still go through also some permitting process, right? You have so to go through, I mean, yeah. You have to get those permitted. So you'll still have to account for, I know some of these companies can build them in like, you know, a couple of weeks, but um, you still have to get the permits approved. So that will probably take two to five months, depending on where you're at. But one thing that I did talk to Sydney about was that with some of these offsite or the SIP panels, which are the structural insulated panels, he says that it would be equivalent to a stick build as far as the valuation goes. So I don't know like how they gauge that, uh, but I think it's definitely a common question. I don't know. It, it's so hard to gauge like how you would, you know, comp out an ADU, let alone a stick build type, a factory build, or, you know, some of these other types of um, builds. 
I have an idea. You know, the interest. <laughs> Tell me. It would be interesting to hear from Sydney on the sips because that is some, one of my, whenever I hear sip, it's like a red flag. I kind mm -hmm. of go, all right, because I get a lot of calls saying, hey, David, could you promote and, or could we do a webinar on our structurally insulated panels? I'm like, well, right. are you built to the, you know, the California building code? Mm -hmm. Are you, do you comply with title, you know, the title 24 energy, 24. Mm -hmm. yeah, energy efficiencies? And most of them can't answer that question. So if they are saying, and Sydney's seeing where they do comply with the California Building Code and the energy efficiencies, you know, I would really like to know about that company. That yeah, does definitely. It. That would be huge. The one thing that I talk about with factory built and with site built is that they're both coded for permanent occupation, which everything else, like tiny homes, are not. So it has to be built to either the federal code, which is right. HUD, or it's built to the state code, which is the California Building Code, for permanent occupation. And so those two categories are going to be able to kind of give you a product that's going to be built to a much higher standard, much higher standard than a tiny home or my experience uh, so far to date with uh, structurally insulated, insulated it's panels. Good. It's like they're not for that. So when it comes to an investor who's looking to add something to their portfolio or a homeowner mm -hmm. that's looking to rent out and have some really good management in place, you want to make sure, number one, you're not liable or put at risk for liability by providing housing that exactly. is not, not built to that standard. Mm -hmm. So, hey, in the state of California, where you and I are at, people like to sue each other for anything. You looked at me Especially strange. Here. I'm gonna <laughs> you. Right. So if there, if somebody you rented the, your um, your ADU out to someone and you have a, a difference of opinion and they sue you and their attorney finds out that you have a ADU that was not built for continuous yeah, habitation, because, guess right. what? You you might have to pay some money or be at risk for even worse, maybe losing your property. Again, the industry is so new. You said it a moment ago. There's going to be a lot more comps out in three to five years, but I, not only comps, but I think problems and issues that people have had, not only right. with management, mm -hmm. with, again, a property values and everything else that's out there. There's going to be a lot of things. And so being at the front of the educational component, I think, is really important. So the ADU University, we're working and building up our library of content. We're going to try to build up a sort of like, hey, come in and have a conversation. We really want to do it for homeowners, investors and real estate agents, because there's just a lot to understand. It's almost impossible to cover even the very tip top of it in 20 or 30 minutes or an hour or 90 minutes. There's just right. so much. We need these regular conversations, which is great that you've done 46 <laughs> yes. of these episodes because you can do a lot. So if you are going to be um, available uh, in September is the 19th and 20th. I think that's when the, the CAR, the California Association of Realtors, is having their annual convention in Anaheim. I will be speaking Wednesday from 9.30 to 10 a.m. I'll be a featured speaker at that event. When I was there um, last year, when it was in Long Beach, I was kind of impressed because these rooms are, you know, a pretty good size. They hold over 100 people, and I think the room I'll be in will be about 150 and most ADU presentations, Stephanie, were packed, standing wow. room only. And this was p real estate agents who were leaning into the conversation then. And so I know that um, there's other people, good people that are out there that are doing presentations and charging for them. And I think that, hey, if you have a good presenter and they're charging right. you a fee, go listen to them. It is really going to be worth your time. And I think you'll definitely get uh, get your money's worth out of it. You'll definitely get money's worth out of it. And I think I wish more realtors would see that strategy because a lot of realtors try to figure out where they fit in the puzzle. And really, you're at the forefront. You're sort of boots on the ground talking to homeowners, talking to investors every day. So you should understand this strategy. But, you know, we don't want to scare off. I think with the conversation, we talked about a lot of the things that we're struggling with right now, which one is financing, two is the, the, the appraisal world. Uh, comping these out correctly. Those are probably the two biggest hurdles. I think the city process can always do better and they'll probably continue to modify things with time. But I would say compared to 2017 to where we are now, we've come a pretty huge. long way huge. and we've done huge progress. And I think other states, like I talked about earlier, 
are catching up and you know new york is incentivizing homeowners to build miami is too um there's other states that are gonna basically follow the blueprint that we're setting in place that's something i'm super proud of too just being from here and kind of setting this the tone for for other states to follow because it is a national issue this housing affordability issue which is why dave and i david and i are so um, passionate about it because we think that through education, we were talking about it offline. He's like, I just don't understand why more people don't pull the trigger, you know? So talking about like the positive things about this is we understand the play. So we don't understand why people don't make moves, why realtors don't understand it, why investors won't implement it and why homeowners aren't looking at their backyard as a ways to help them with their retirement, help them with cash flow, help them fund their son's tuition whatever it is, like have a yoga studio and like monetize it. I don't care. Like I've heard it all. So we've understood that this strategy works. We're, and we we're talking about it offline. He's like, I don't know why people don't do it. And I'm like, it's because they don't have the knowledge. It's right. The knowledge is what gives you the confidence to want to ask those questions. So we're saying get educated first, however long that takes you, but don't stay too, too stuck in that phase to where you're researching for months and months at a time go to professionals like myself or David, have a conversation. I'll sit on the phone and have a 30 minute conversation and really dive deep and be super transparent with timeframes, costs, um, timelines and workflows and like really give you the, the good and the bad, but the good always outweighs the bad. And that is that it's the way for you to be able to create so much more wealth. Um, and once you understand the strategy, that knowledge is gonna give you the confidence to wanna move forward. But you got to pick up the phone or you got to have a conversation, you know, read the ADU ordinance, maybe start off there. <laughs> I think so. I think you're right. And I and I and I appreciate you making that um, point because so quickly I can get into the the weeds, jump down the, the rabbit holes and kind of dive into this, you know, very dense topic. And I think that where homeowners are overwhelmed is one understanding the term accessory dwelling unit is kind of doesn't really resonate with still majority of people. But the folks that are looking at it, I think, can get overwhelmed because of pricing. I mean, you and I see this all the time. You know, what should right. the price per square foot be? And some people hear something like $150 a square foot or they hear $350 or a square 500, foot. Or 500 right. Or 500 if you're in Northern California, where, where uh, wages and housing is so just massively expensive. The number one thing, and I think your yours is what you're talking about. If you're looking at developing an ADU in your property, do it. It doesn't matter if it's a site build or if it's something that's been pre-designed or pre-built or factory built, just do it. You know, just kind of take your time, be patient, and don't get lost in that in or taken in by people saying, oh, you can do it for a lot less. Um, a year ago when we I was at the California Association of Realtors. I was walking in to do my presentation. I got a call from a woman who said who was really struggling and she was struggling because a contractor said she could build her ADU for 150,000 and she was already into it for about 130,000 and she still had so much more work to do. She was well going to go over the 150,000 and that's the unfortunate part because people who say I can do it for less are trying sometimes are trying to pull you in and not mm -hmm. telling you the full story. The over, and so that's why ADUs can be kind of intimidating, but take your time. And it is so important to talk to professionals so you can understand all of the aspects to understand is everything included in that pricing? Look at a breakdown, look at an Excel spreadsheet. And, and if you have a question, you know, it, the best money you could spend is to have somebody look at it for you, to have right. to talk to someone such as yourself or myself or other people that are part of our networks that are here to try to help you do that development. You don't have to work with me to do it. They don't have to work with you to do it, but just do it. We really want to kind of encourage you to pursue this path because as Stephanie, you've mentioned, this is a great way to, to increase your wealth, mm -hmm. be able to ha have additional income. And that, because right now everything is getting more expensive in our lives. Right. And how to help offset this is just to develop something in your backyard. Yeah, and even though ADUs will become a little bit more expensive as the demand increases, it's just a supply and demand issue. Um, it's still the best way to go. You know, it's still much more cost effective than buying a second home at, at, in this current market or doing a cash out refi 
to buy other property. You're better off, you know, getting a HELOC, funding your own backyard, and then leveraging that for future. I think um, I always tell my clients, I do consultations. The first step is getting financing in place. Once you figure out how much you can fund, then you build based on that. And even then you want to give yourself a buffer, right? Because right. one of the things I offer in, in my feasibilities is I do a feasibility inspection. I, I also do a, a proposal and a rental analysis. So I give you like all the numbers you need, right? How much is it going to cost to build? And we go over worst case, best case scenario. Sometimes like I had a client where in Cyprus, I think that for that one, we were going to do SB9. Two or 200 to 600 square foot ADUs, but it was a corner lot. So the city wanted us to build a sidewalk and a driveway, right? So, and that was going to be an additional cost of 15 to 20,000. We don't know, Easily. right? Until we get to that point. And so it's those conversations that I had with the client right off the back. Like we did the feasibility, we called the city, we did our due diligence, and we told her, look, here's the proposal for what the two ADUs will cost. But, you know, worst case, you also got to factor in that fifteen to $20,000 cost on the sidewalk and who knows what else they may ask for. And you got you kind of have to prepare. So she was going to get a HELOC. And what I told her was to get a HELOC for fifty to 60000 above what we had quoted her for the build out because you never know. And then the cool thing about the HELOC is, you know, if you don't use the money, then then you're fine. Um, so. That that was like another hack too is understanding, you know, get get a feasibility after you figure out the financing, and then figure out how much it's going to cost to build and how much you can run it out for. So that's sort of what I kind of help them with because it's a lot to learn. You know, we've talked everything we've talked about so far. It's like you want to build an ADU. Now you got to understand architectural plans. Now you have to understand Title Twenty Four. Now you have to understand financing, property management, construction, managing it all. And you don't have to. It sounds like a lot, but I think it's you just understanding whose role is for what so that you understand how to communicate with these people. And terminology gives you that confidence. Now you know what to ask for, right? Whether you come to me or come to David, understand those those three terms that I just talked about. Feasibility, proposals, rental analysis, or some sort of cash flow analysis to help you determine whether this is a good play or not. And it is, but now it's just a matter of who you choose to work with, right? And so I think it's super cool that you have the ADU University. I see everything that you do. And that's why we we connect so well because we're so passionate. You know, as you guys can hear it in my voice, we are passionate, we're ADU geeks. <laughs> and we're probably yeah. gonna do a meetup <laughs> together because we just want more people to be um, educated on this. And then uh, hopefully, you know, we just have a whole bunch of case studies that we can share with people and continue to advocate and continue to help each other. The estate planning was a huge gem too. I encourage you guys to really look at your assets and figure out how you're going to protect your assets through a trust, through, you know, whatever it is. And you, if you guys need help, I'm sure you guys can reach out to David or myself. Um, I encourage my clients to always just figure out how they're going to, um, disperse everything but these are hard conversations that people don't like to have you know it's it's but do you need to have these conversations with your family who's doing what and who's in charge of what put it on paper you don't want to have to go back and you know fight no. for money it's like the worst but we it don't is, talk about is. that enough it is the yeah. worst and i and and i would invite you stephanie i'd be happy to participate if we could do something in burbank where we can I educate real estate agents and homeowners. Uh, we do have the, the association here has about uh, room for about 150. And I think we could easily fill that. And if we don't, I know oh, that yeah. the ones that are going to be there are going to be really appreciative of it because mm -hmm. this is just a shorter kind of condensed conversation just to kind of say, Hey folks, if you're thinking about doing an ADU, you should, you can talk to Stephanie, you can talk to me, you can visit the aduuniversity.org and sign up for our free webinars. And we're going to be making some uh, pretty exciting changes here in the very near future. Awesome. Yeah. Sign me up. I already told you I'm up for it. I'll get Sydney to walk out there too, or drive out there. Um, and we can definitely pack it up with 150 people. Not a problem. I think a lot of people are eager to learn about it too. Um, so for any of you who maybe want us to go speak at your office or do a webinar, we're also open to collaborating. David has a podcast as well. I've been on his podcast. He's now been on mine. 
So yeah, stay tuned, guys. We're definitely gonna have a meetup. I was thinking, and we were talking offline. We were thinking like October, November, uh, but we'll definitely share details on my Instagram. David, where can people connect with you? We'll leave, we'll leave it at that for today. Um, the number one place is either if you're going to follow me um, on my personal um, Facebook page, David Donahue, which is, you know, you can see that right there. Also, aduuniversity.org. You can sign up for our newsletters and get notified of our upcoming webinars. And then if you just kind of look for David Donahue or ADU University on the socials, you'll be able to find a lot of places. Yeah, you're everywhere. You're, I need to keep up with you. I'm usually more on Instagram than some Facebook, but yeah, make sure you guys check out David guys and understand the ADU play from his perspective. He's spent a lot of time creating the ADU university and has a ton of resources. Thank you again, David, for your time. We will see you guys on the next one. And yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Thanks, Stephanie.